Well, one of the most difficult things to do is to be honest with ourselves. We're often our own biggest fans. Uh, we, we know what that's like. We, we kind of like ourselves, and so it can be difficult to examine, to do the things that God has asked us to do. We like who we are. We end up focusing on the mistakes and shortcomings of others. The problem is there is none, not one, that is fine just the way we are. We are not okay just the way we are. And again, that can be a tough conclusion to come to. The second we begin to think that, that we've gotten off track. We have not yet inherited all power and glory. It's a fact. We have not yet inherited all power and glory. We have not yet been transformed, inheriting the crown, the throne. We are in the process. We are in the process, but we have not yet achieved our salvation. There is more work to be done. And that's for every single one of us individually. We are measured, not against any man, not against each other. We are measured against God the Father and Jesus Christ. That is intimidating. That's the bar. God the Father and Jesus Christ, their character, their nature, to talk like them, to think like them, and ultimately to become just like them, born into the God family. Again, that's the bar. That's, that's what the level is. That's what we're being measured against. And then we're given this time these weeks leading up to Passover, yes, I'm going into Passover, uh, about less than seven weeks away, we're given this time right now to intentionally examine ourselves openly and honestly. Again, that's tough to do. In humility, we are to cry out to God, to show our, asking Him to show us our weaknesses. Not that there's ever a time where we shouldn't be examining and evaluating, we should continue to do that throughout the year. But this is crunch time. This is us getting ready to once again wash the feet of our brother and sister in Christ, to take these things that are symbolic of the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's a big deal. And it requires us to take it seriously, to take the time, the moments we have right now, and really push ourselves in order to get ready. This will no doubt be a difficult Passover for many of God's people. Which means we all have to take it seriously. We have to evaluate our state of mind. How am I doing? Where is my head at? My thoughts, my heart, my mind. I've got to examine. And nobody can do that for me. Nobody can do it for you. And only you will know whether or not you've really put in the time. Whether well, just go through the motions, we take some symbols and move on. It's up to us. Every one of us individually. As we prepare, we have to ask ourselves some tough questions. That's what the evaluation process is all about. Sometimes it's easier when you have somebody else examining or evaluating you. Perhaps they give you a checklist. You just kind of check these things off. Be like, yep, fantastic. I'm doing awesome. I'm ready. But when we're talking about spiritual matters, we're talking about our actual character, how we live, how we think. It's difficult because as we've already said that we're our own biggest fans. It's hard to look inside, to dig, to uncover. Asking God to mercifully reveal to us sin in our own lives, it's hard to do. But that is what we've signed up for. Are we harboring anger, bitterness, contempt? It's easy to say no. No, I'm fantastic. I'm fine just the way I am. It's very easy to say, no, that's not me. That's not my problem. I'm doing great. But if we think about it, is there anyone you're leaving off your foot washing list? It's funny to imagine you have to walk in and see somebody else. You go, I will wash everyone's feet except that person. Could you wash anyone's feet? We're not talking about just here in this room, but perhaps anyone anywhere. Do we have the heart? Do we have the love that God himself and Jesus Christ have demonstrated? Again, it comes back to us examining ourselves. How are we doing? We measure ourselves according to God the Father and Jesus Christ. Are we prepared to take that unleavened bread and the wine representing the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ? We will do this in a worthy manner, or we will not. We cannot bury some sin or put it off again until next year. Sometimes that happens. Are there people we haven't spoken to in months or years? Family members, members of the body of Christ, have we made every attempt, as much as it depends on us, to bring peace? Have we, or are we even capable of laying down our life for our brother or sister? 
laying down our pride, our ego, our arrogance, to embrace once again and open the door for a peaceful future. What is the character and nature of God? Is that our character and nature today? That's what this is all about. It really breaks down. It is that simple. Who is God? How does he think? How does he live? And who are we? And do these two things add up? Are we there yet? No. And so we get to work. Our title, if you'd like one today, For God So Loved the World. For God So Loved the World. I think it's one of the most difficult things to do in this life to fully understand and comprehend the level of sacrifice made by our father and elder brother. I have a difficult time considering it. When you go back to the facts of the matter, which we are going to start, let's go ahead and turn to John chapter 1. When we go back to the facts of the matter, we see exactly what has taken place, how God has described the events. We know that John chapter 1 and verse 1 is the beginning of the beginning, right? This predates Genesis chapter 1. John chapter 1. And let's go to verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is, young people, you haven't uh, gone back and visited this, or you uh, haven't talked about it in a little while, this Word is representative of Jesus Christ. This is the same being that would be Jesus Christ, okay? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, didn't he just say that? We did, right? We, he did. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And then in verse 2, he says, he was in the beginning with God. See how God repeats himself? I love when he does that. Because when he's doing it, he wants to make a point. Don't miss it. Don't skip over it. Go back. Yes, it does sound like your parents repeat themselves sometimes. Young people, that happens. And they're doing that to make sure you don't forget. Grab your clothes, grab your shoes, brush your teeth, get down the car. Get your shoes, your clothes, brush your teeth, sometimes in a different order, but we arrange the order in order to help you stay on the edge of your seat, okay? So that you follow everything that we're saying. God repeats himself, pay attention. That's what he's doing. Every time he does that, he's basically saying, stop, hold on, pay attention. This is important. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. And right there, there's another example. All things were made through him, and nothing was made that was made without him. He says the same thing, but he changes a couple words, reverses it again to leave an impression. Help us remember. Make sure we know. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This is the beginning. God the Father, Jesus Christ, together. It's important we understand what's about to take place as it's being summarized here by John. Uh, let's see. If, let's drop down to verse, um, tell you what, let's go to verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made through him. Notice how it says it again. The world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Again, we're talking about begotten sons and daughters. We understand that there is a special time coming when we will be totally born into the God family, but it's not yet. We are begotten, not yet born. Verse 14 continues. And the word became flesh, the one who would be Jesus Christ, the being that was together right there with the Father from the very beginning. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is a fact. Again, if you believe in God, if you believe God wrote this book, then as you go through and read every word, every single word is inspired by him. It's his word. This is his mind in print. So when he says this, exactly what has taken place, this being that then became flesh, that then became a man, after he had emptied himself of his power and glory. This is what God is describing to us. Now again, we could just kind of move on and say, well, great, thank you very much, I appreciate that. I'm sure we understand to the depth of what he is talking about right there. That's, it's pretty intense. God the Father, Jesus Christ, that they would do this together. And they're doing it with a very special purpose in order, of course, to open the door to their family. 
willing to lay down everything to make it possible. It's very difficult for us in the flesh to understand exactly what it is he's saying. Nevertheless, he gave us this so that we could push ourselves, meditate on it, pray about it, asking for a greater depth of understanding, to make sure that we can grow and learn and somehow connect to this reality that it might change who we are. No more excuses about our life and our actions. We understand there is God and there is none like him. That is who we measure ourselves against. We are not trying to outrun each other. We are trying to catch up to Jesus Christ, to be just like him. So when he describes these things, the type of conditions, how far he's willing to go, we should consider. How far are you willing to go? How far, how hard will you push to change who you are to become just like him? The one who existed from eternity in all power and glory, who dwelt with God the Father, became flesh. I know I'm saying the same thing. I get it. You guys look at me like, I feel like we just hit rewind, like 10 seconds. I'm saying the same thing. He emptied himself of the power and glory that he had before and took upon himself the nature of the seed of Abraham. Abraham. He would have to war against the flesh. If you think that's not true, then you are mistaken, tempted in all points. He knows to pretend like, well, he doesn't really know what I'm going through. It's hard today. It's not the same. He didn't have to deal with things I got to deal with today. He was tempted in all points. Yet, without sin. There is no excuse. The bar is Jesus Christ. Be holy for I am holy. That's it? Okay. Well, just be holy from here on out. I'm glad that we all agree. That's so simple. Very easy. Got it. It is difficult. But again, who signed up for this? I know some folks are, uh, are right now uh, counseling for baptism. You're going like, what did I sign up? What are we talking about? This is a big deal. We consider what it is that we've actually signed up. But we signed on the dotted line willingly. We actually said, yeah, sure, I'm in. I'll do it. Did we really count the cost? Did we understand? I don't know if there's really any of us who really understood in that moment before we were baptized. And every year that goes by, we go, <laughs> I didn't see that coming. But here we are, continuing to dedicate ourselves to change who we are, to become just like him. Let's go to Philippians 2. Read another account of this. Confirmation again of the process that took place. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to go to verse 6. She's just sitting here like this in the front row. You guys can't see it, but she's just sitting here like this. She's watching. Okay. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Let's go ahead and start in verse 5, just because it, it kind of describes the mind that is expected out of us. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The same mind. Not a big deal. Again, just think exactly like Jesus Christ. Okay. Let his mind, let this mind be in you. This is how you should think. Think this way. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When we look at this again, to see him emptying himself, make himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, humbling himself, think about what we've done in this life. Have we gone that far? There's a, a moment that it talks about with Paul saying, you've not yet resisted to bloodshed. You haven't gone that far. Jesus Christ went all the way, left everything. Again, how much did he really give up to be God? Was there ever a chance that he could have failed? Well, no, no, Christ could have never failed. Well, that's not true. If he was tempted at all points, if that does, if that's the case, if Christ could not have sinned, then the whole thing is a moot point. The whole thing is worthless. It doesn't really mean anything to sacrifice that. It's a big deal. The sacrifice works because it was possible. For him to do what he did, open the door that our sins could be forgiven. So to see that he did this, to go through all of that, to give everything up for the chance that someone else would get an opportunity, not even knowing whether or not we do it or not. What was he hoping for? Two? Three maybe? I really hope somebody does it. 
And you and I, the, here's the gift. Here's the opportunity set right here before us because we read these verses and we actually know. We actually understand the truth, which is what a, a, such an incredible gift. A gift of understanding. The veil has been lifted. We can read this and it makes sense. It doesn't happen that way for the rest of the world. It's a gift of understanding that God gives. We can read these words. And so do we look at this, consider it and say, you know what? I got to change. This is what he did. This is what he wants me to do. Have we done it? It's a tough question. It's very easy just to go, yes, or very easy to sit in the chair right now or for me to stand up here and be like, well, I'm talking to all of them. I'm awesome. Or for you to sit in that chair right now and go, well, I know he ain't talking to me. He must be talking to my wife. You know? Just kidding. My wife's not here. If you haven't noticed, the, the, the length of my facial hair tells you how long I've been away from my wife. The longer it gets, because as soon as I get home, she's going to be like, you better cut that off your face right now. I'll say, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Jesus Christ, God the Father, humbling themselves together. And to think that the Father did not sacrifice, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Kind of gave it away. Spoiler alert, the title is, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. God, the reference to the Father. Okay, spoiler alert, I know. We'll get there, okay? They gave up the power, the glory, that he may submit himself as the perfect and acceptable sacrifice. Did Jesus Christ know this in advance, or at least know and understand what was going to be required of him? Of course, he wrote the book. It's his plan together with the Father. They sat down, drew it all up, had it all planned out, knew exactly what it was going to take, knew that the only way for this to work, for you and I to have an opportunity, was going to be shed blood. The only way, through a perfect sacrifice, once for all. That's it. So Jesus Christ, who had known these things in advance, then goes and does it anyways. Again, do we understand, have we meditated on in preparation for the Passover? If we haven't, that's why we're having this conversation right now. This is the perfect time. We're getting ready. Take it seriously. This is how we get ready. We get all of ourselves, the right frame of mind, ready to go for what we're about to do. Let's go to Isaiah 53. You all know where I'm going? It's all right. Isaiah 53. We're going to go to verse 1. Did Jesus Christ know in advance what was going to be required of him? Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the eternal been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Let's stop for a second. This is written, the prophet Isaiah, he wrote these words, right? Well, true, but God inspired every letter, every word. The one who would be Jesus Christ. He's helping him write these words. And keep in mind, this is not too far off. Jesus Christ, who has existed for all eternity, understands a clock is ticking at this point, knowing that he is getting very close to him coming in the flesh. The words that he's inspiring Isaiah to read, it's coming. He's getting very close. The moment of which everything hinges upon. Christ cannot come and fail. He's got to get this right. And he's writing about what's about to happen just a short length of time away. When he says that there's no beauty that we should desire him, he's despised and rejected by men, he knew what was going to happen before it happened. And he was going to do it anyways. That's impressive. And that's difficult, again, for us to wrap our minds around. Not just that he knew what was going to happen, but they designed the plan this way. Because it is the only way. This is the nature of God the Father and Jesus Christ. This is who they are. And this is what we are supposed to become. It says, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. We hide our faces in shame. We hide our faces in fear. This is what he's describing. And he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Why would we do that? Who would do that? If you knew better, would you really do that? We all war against the flesh. We're fighting against our own human nature. The Apostle Paul, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank the Lord through Jesus Christ. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Why would we do that, knowing all that we know? Why do we still make mistakes? Just like the Apostle Paul, believe it or not, we're still in the flesh. We're not there yet. That's the point. To make sure we all understand that we have a healthy, honest evaluation of ourselves. We look inside and we go, I'm not him. I know that. We abhor self. 
and we repent in dust and ashes. This is how we get ready. Right now, we've got to go back and review. What did he do? What has he done? And what must we do? What is required of us? Verse 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken. Did we deserve that? Did he deserve that? No, in both accounts. Smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, not his. Whose fault? His or ours. We know better. Every one of us had our part in the death, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Every single one of us. To lie to ourselves or somehow put that out of our mind because it's too hard to consider. It's too much to think about. We feel guilty. We need to go back, review, humble ourselves, cry out to God. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. We talk about these things many times during uh, laying out of hands through uh, anointings. We go right back to this. Again, another part of the blessings that God bestows on us. That he would take all of our afflictions upon himself. That he would, we would be healed both physically and spiritually. The two things combined. It's powerful. It's deep. And we have to connect to it. By his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep, every single one of us, have turned astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the eternal has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The judgment should have been, it's ours. It's our fault. But you and I, thankfully, have this Redeemer. The one who would lay down everything. Nothing held back. And again, hoping that there would be those who would turn to him. Desiring, Mr. Dixon was talking about, none to perish, all to come to repentance. Verse 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened out his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Did he try to justify his act? Well, that's not fair. You can't do this to me. I didn't do anything. I don't deserve this. That's not what he did. Silent. Fulfilled his role, did his job. That's the expectation. Again, this is the example. There is God, there's none like him. We're trying to be like that. This is the only way for us. It's not an option. He's not just, well, I hope, you know, do your best, however you can figure this out. A little bit here and there, that's fine. It's not fine. It's all the way. We hold nothing back. Will we be perfect? It says the corruptible puts on incorruption. So no, uh, you all know, we all know, but we will be fighting for it. We will never settle. We'll never make excuses. He says here again, he opened not his mouth. It's so easy. What? Could you, could you imagine Jesus Christ going on social media being like, you don't know what they did to me. Man, this ain't fair. It's not. What did he do? What does he expect of us? Look at what he did. Follow the example. He opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased the eternal to bruise him. That is a crazy sentence. It pleased the eternal to bruise him? Can you imagine that? You ever talk to your parents as we spank our children? They say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. I love you, that's why I'm doing this. We want to shape their character, help them to change, give them an opportunity. God understood, he knew what this would do for us. He knew this was the only way and it was progress. We're almost there, we're almost there, just a little further. God the Father, Jesus Christ had to do their part, both of them, both sacrificed. They had to do their part or the door would not be open. We would be stuck and we would come to the inevitable end of mankind. That's not what happened. They did their job. They fulfilled with total outgoing concern and unconditional love. What are the conditions? <laughs> I know, but there's a few. I will love you if you... There's none. Unconditional. It pleased the eternal to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Remember Christ even praying the moment, the Garden of Gethsemane? Father, if this cup can pass from me, reminds us that Jesus Christ knows what's coming. He understands, and even in that physical moment, he's going, 
do we think everything through? Is, it, is there any other way possible? We've got to go all the way. And the Father, of course, this is the only way. And Christ, he knew it. But it's still us warring against the flesh. He shall see his seed. I'm sorry, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the eternal shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Once again, the reminder, there is joy, there's hope. He's done this for a purpose, to make sure the door was open. And he set the example, and so here we have this opportunity to become full members in the God family. He knew this before he did it. And he would do so to open this door, knowing his sacrifice was the only way. Which one of us is worthy? Which one has deserved this kind of sacrifice and forgiveness? None. This was simply a display of the character and nature of God, the demonstration of God's unconditional love that he expects us to emulate. It's not a choice. The just for the unjust, he died for us. He took our place. One died for all. He has redeemed us from the curse of the law that we might live as he lives. Because it's not supposed to stop there. Not just the fact that God the Father, Jesus Christ, did what they were supposed to do. You and I are supposed to then respond in kind. We're supposed to be like him. As a being that gave everything, could we do the same? Could we give everything? Let's go to John 3. We'll read the verse, uh, the title of the sermon today. What is it? Uh, probably one of the most popular verses in the world, right? The world takes it and they mess it all up, and so we just don't turn there anymore. We're like, well, they, they got a monopoly on John 3.16. We're not allowed to go there, right? I don't think so. Let's go ahead. We'll, we'll grab it back for a second, okay? John 3. John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So notice this is Christ talking about the Father. Yes, the Father has been involved in every part of the process all the way. What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. It's important to him. The world will try to paint the picture like, well, Jesus loves you. He does. He loves you. He's a big fan of yours. God the Father, he's the mean old God of the Old Testament, which is not true at all. Okay, we know Jesus Christ, the same one, the God of the Old Testament, the same one who would come in the flesh. Nevertheless, God continues, read what the Bible says. What does he say? It says, God loved the world. God the Father loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Notice the sacrifice was not just of Jesus Christ. I've talked about this before. I'm sure many of us have considered this, especially in our lifetime and our, our journey, this path. To know a parent that you're sitting watching your child be scourged, tortured, and beaten, and you have all power to stop it, and yet you don't. You stand there and watch, or you sit there and watch as they do it. I don't know if I could do that with my own children. To imagine they take even one of them, to take them and set them down, to scourge, to torture, to beat. And I would just let it happen? I imagine God the Father in this moment, what that must have been like. And he has all power to stop it. He could snap. He could blink. He could do whatever he wants. And in that moment, enough, stop. No, we're not doing this. We'll find another way. We're going to do it another way. I don't like it. We're not doing it. That's not what he did. He allowed Jesus Christ so that this door could be opened. Together, the sacrifice they have made, the door has been opened. And it says here that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now the world, this is why the world uses this. All you got to do, accept Jesus into your heart. You just believe. And then you're good to go. Your actions don't matter. Your works don't matter. You don't have to worry about doing the right thing. Not at all. Because you've accepted Jesus into your heart. Because you simply believe, and belief is enough. We all know that's a lie. 
And although the Bible makes that perfectly clear, he even continues in the same context, just one paragraph later, to make sure we understand deeds, works, actions, they do matter. We know that belief, there's a difference. The demons believe and tremble, right? We know that there is living faith and dead faith. Well, I believe in God. That's not enough. Show me. That's what God says. Show me. Let me see it. I want to see your faith. Let me see it. Show me your works. This is how I know. Your belief is not enough. Your belief is dead if there are no actions to support it. That whoever believes in him through living faith should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's an interesting concept. It's not here to condemn, but through the world, they might be given the opportunity. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. And then verse 21, here's what we were talking about earlier, the actions. But he who does the truth, not just knows it, knowing is not enough. We have to change who we are. Think like him, become like him. Our actions matter. He who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds, he says it again, his deeds may be clearly seen. Let me see them, that they have been done in God. God the Father, Jesus Christ giving everything, holding nothing back, that we may have opportunity for eternal life and the most incredible inheritance as members of the family of God. He expects us then to respond in kind. He shows the example, which we've only looked at just three, three places. Very briefly, just to describe it, there's a lot more study we can do on this, but we're going to keep moving on. If you'd like to go back and keep studying about the sacrifice God made, God the Father, Jesus Christ. <coughs> To prove it once again, to remember who did this, they did. They gave up everything. Now, how do you and I again wrap our mind around that? What do you own that you value the most? And would you give it all up for somebody else? That's tough. What do you value the most? And would you give it all up for somebody else? Let's just imagine you had a hundred million dollars in the bank. That's a lot of money to me. Fifty bucks sounds like a lot of money to me. That's a hundred million dollars. Let's make it a hundred billion. Why not? I don't, it doesn't matter, right? You want more than that? Is that fine? hundred million? hundred million dollars in the bank. Okay. Would you set a match to it, burn it all for the chance that another who didn't deserve it, who hadn't even asked for it, who after you had given up everything for that individual would then kill you? And then would you do all of that just so that person could have a chance to share in everything you already had at the beginning. I had the hundred million dollars, why did I do all that? I could just kept it and enjoyed the rest of my eternity. That's not what he did, gave everything up. And you and I, how far would we go? What would you give up? Have you? Is there anything we're holding on to right now? We gotta examine, we gotta look inside. What are we doing? How are we living? How do we think? Do our actions represent the character and nature of God himself? How far would you go? Would you give it all? For somebody else? Whew. I might do it for me or my kids. Somebody I don't even know? Somebody I don't even like? Somebody who doesn't even care about me? It's not even gonna, I, that's hard to think about. But do we really have a choice? What did God think about these things. How does God live? What did he do? He sets the example. We have no choice. We have to become like him. It defies human logic. It's a crazy thing to consider, but do we really understand the unconditional love of our father and elder brother? Do we really get it? What were their conditions for such an outpouring of love? There weren't any. There weren't any. They did this without any one of us asking for forgiveness. If you say you're sorry, then well, maybe I'll consider doing that. They didn't ask for an apology. They did it first, hoping then that we would take the right steps. None of us deserving of such love, and they did it anyways. Are we ready to do the same? This Passover, are we ready to lay down our lives, our pride, our ego, our vanity for each other and go all the way? 
right now, in this time of preparation, we must examine every part of our lives, every relationship of our lives to uncover our weaknesses, anything that might hold us back or hinder a deeper relationship with God. The fact that we may take Passover in a worthy manner, examining ourselves as God has given us the appropriate time. We are preparing to reaffirm our commitment to our covenant with God himself. And we have to ask ourselves, am I really ready for the Passover? Let's go to Matthew 5. Are we just going through the motions? Are we just rehearsing symbols and tradition? Matthew 5, verse uh, let's see here. Let's go to verse 21. Matthew 5. Are we going through the motions? Are we rehearsing symbols and tradition? I kept the Passover last year. I might as well do it again this year. I know somebody will notice if I'm not there. I've got to do something. Matthew 5, verse 21, the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of Gehenna fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. It's interesting. Stop. He said, stop. Nope. Leave that right there. We got something to handle first. Before we get up, before that moment, we got to stop here for a second and consider, is there any issue? Notice it doesn't say that, is there any problem you have against somebody else? It says, if your brother has something against you. That's interesting. Be like, I don't got problems with nobody. I love everybody. Everybody's great. Is it the same way? Is it reciprocated? Is there an issue out there that we need to address at some point, some way, to say, hey, let's talk about this. If you bring your gift to the altar, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar. Go your way. Be reconciled first to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Well, this is Jesus Christ talking. Does this matter? This is what he expects out of us. Did he say it just, well, you know, very specific cases? Was he talking about everything? This is what it takes. I mean, this is a big deal. These are the expectations of God. There's no, there's no arguing that. Again, it's in red in my Bible, right? That means it's Christ talking, so I guess we'll listen to this one. If it was in black, then we could, like, theoreticize, but Christ speaking it. Let's see if he keeps talking. This is the same chapter, verse 43. We're jumping over a lot, I know, but we've got to do this for the sake of time. Matthew 5, verse 43 says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Well, I guess we don't have to love our neighbor then anymore. That's, whew. There's only one or the other. We don't have to do both, right? Uh-oh. Well, no, no, no. We know better. You shall love your neighbor. And he's saying, we got to go even further than that. I want you to love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Are you crazy? Did Christ do this? Did God the Father do this? Well, yes. Is that the example they set? Yes. Is that for us to do? Nah. I mean, when they change us, I don't got to worry about doing that now because I can't. That's too hard anyways. I shouldn't even try. The expectation is for us to do it just like them. No excuses. Do we know better? Yes. If we're reading these verses right now and we've done it however many, a hundred times, thousand times, how many times we've gone through these verses, we can't argue. We know better. The question is, have we done it? Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. It doesn't make human logical sense. It doesn't. When somebody does something wrong to you, oftentimes your friend, if they're not in the church, family not in the church, will be like, yeah, you get them. They deserve it, right? Man, you don't deserve that. Well, you need justice. That's what you need. It ain't fair what's happened. Apparently, that really doesn't matter. Verse 45 says, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. That's a big part of this right there. He's telling you, do it just like me. If you want to have any part with me, this is God talking again. If you want to have any part with me, then you're going to have to do these things that are seemingly impossible. You're going to have to do it just like I do it. If you want to be sons, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the uh, evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, 
What reward have you? That's easy. To, well, you love me. That's, you're easy to love. But somebody who doesn't love you, you're going to go out of your way to love them? Maybe. I mean, I could say it. Yeah, I love, I love them. I do. What kind of love? Are there any conditions? I'll love them as long as they, they're nice to me. I mean, what if they're not nice to you? Well, then I don't love them. I mean, this is an easy conversation. I love this. This is great. What does he say? You love them unconditionally. What are the conditions? That's the point of unconditional love. There aren't any. Well, that's tough to do. If you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Everybody, the world does this. They don't know the truth. They don't have a measure of God himself dwelling in you. Dwelling in me. We have that power inside of us, and we're supposed to use it and increase in it and do the things that defy logic because that's what he expects. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Verse 48, <laughs> this verse is ridiculous. Uh, Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Uh, again? These are the expectations. Oh, is that all? Be holy for I am holy. That's it. You shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's what he expects. If you don't like it, then go and do something else. Forget all of it. Don't waste your time. Go play golf on Saturday. Go do whatever it is you want. Go work. Go do whatever it is. Because it doesn't matter at that point. It doesn't. Either we're all in and we're just like this. We're going to commit ourselves to this way of life. Or we're not. And it's all just a game. And we have the version of righteousness, or we have the forms of godliness. Perhaps we have something like a whitewashed tomb, but inside are dead man's bones. We look very religious, very holy on the outside, and people see us put on ties and go to church on a Saturday. And wow, they got some weird traditions. They keep the Passover. What are they, Jewish? They understand these people must be very religious. Show me, God says. Be perfect just like me. Let me see your actions. Does it reflect my nature? When they see us, do they see God? I'm afraid I've probably disappointed quite a few, quite a few times in my life. You're thinking about those who know you the best, right? Your family, your wife, your kids. Oh, my wife knows me real well. I'm sure Jason's perfect, holy, righteous character all the time. It's easy when you're just so amazing like I am. It's tough. What's crazy is we even let down with those we love the most. And we should perhaps go even further. With our own children, do we set the right example? I have to consider that. I have four kids. It's my fault. I had four kids. It's my responsibility to set the right example. They're going to know. It's just a game. Yeah, he gets up there and he speaks for an hour, but you guys don't know him like I know him. I think about these things. Do our actions line up with our words? And we have pushed ourselves to be like him. Unwilling to compromise the word of God so that we may be just like him. To be perfect just as our Father in heaven is perfect. Reconciliation isn't convincing the other person that you're right and they're wrong. It's opening the door for peace, extending mercy, compassion for another, giving the benefit of the doubt. This happens. We have moments where we don't give the other the benefit of the doubt. Very quick to judge, very quick to, to come to anger, to points of contention. It happens. Let's imagine a, a totally ridiculous scenario. Let's imagine that um, uh, I've been driving. I'm on the road. been a long day. My wife's uh, been home. She's Oh, we got four kids. She's got laundry. And you know, when you're folding laundry, like little kids' laundry, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Little kids' laundry is the most unstable laundry. It just falls over. You try to stack it up and it just falls over because nothing folds the right way, and I hate it. I hate it. these little tiny pants, and they just, fall, they just fall over, and I hate it. It needs to be bigger, but if it's bigger, then it doesn't work. No, I'm sorry. I'm getting distracted. Okay. She's folding the laundry, laundry, mountains of laundry, because that's what we got. And it's to the ceiling, right? And you got all these stacks. She's got it all laid up on the bed. looks great. Totally a hypothetical scenario, by the way. So totally got it all laid out. And I come home, not paying attention, not thinking. I'm tired. Okay? I'm walking in. I'm going to take off my coat, take it off. I toss it aside on the bed. 
hits the bed, and then the worst possible scenario takes place, okay? Because I didn't see, which you think, how could you miss the mountain of laundry that's there, all folded, stacked neatly, this piles to the ceiling, and a domino effect takes place. Ding, 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 the whole thing just starts knocking off. Everything falls out of the total mess, right? But I never see it. So as I leave the room, go back out, do whatever, I, I am totally oblivious, hypothetically, not me, but we're seeing hypotheticals. Somebody out there, imagine a scenario, somebody out there totally oblivious to this thing, and then what happens? The wife comes in, sees this thing, and she has two options here, right? Look at this and go, oh, my husband, he loves me so much. I know he would never, ever do that on purpose because his love and care, outgoing concern for me, he would never allow that to happen. I know this must be some crazy mistake. I bet you it was one of the kids. I was just one of the kids. Or, how dare he? He did this on purpose. He came in knowing all the work I put in here and destroyed it. Because he doesn't love me, doesn't care about me. I, nothing about what I do doesn't respect who I am. Every one of us have to consider these things, these moments. There are always opportunities, especially in our relationships. Our relationships are a big part of our life. The interactions we have with each other. Are we willing to give each other the benefit of the doubt? Will we go as far as it takes? Can we make room for repentance? Have we left any room in there even for the other? Would my wife, uh, uh, hypothetically, would this woman, would she leave room for repentance of this man or condemn him in judgment? How dare you be gone? Would you leave room for repentance? Can we give time for each other? Maybe I need to pray and fast about how I throw my coat. I hope you see the analogy we're making over and over, how far we take it. Will we leave room for repentance of the other individual? We, we give them time to eventually evaluate, to consider these things, to make changes, to eventually be on the same page. And if God is working with us and we submit ourselves to this way of humility with a poor and contrite spirit, which fears God, trembles at his word, absolutely, if we do that, there will be room. In that case, as God continues to shape and mold us eventually, he will make it clear. But only if we remove our pride and arrogance, if we can see ourselves, examine, if we can evaluate, if we can give room for repentance, if we can give the benefit of the doubt, if we can give that outpouring of love, care, and concern, if we can stay focused on working that plank out of our own eye, because that's what God expects us to be working on. The only people you can control in this room are yourselves, myself. That's all I can control, the actions I take, my mind, my heart, my attitude. We can try to inspire that in others, to exhort, to edify, to strengthen. But the bottom line is every one of us makes an individual decision about every choice and every relationship, every aspect of our lives. So knowing all of this, what is our responsibility? As we remember this reality, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we keep going back and putting all of this together, his shed blood, broken body. Are we tasked, again, to reaffirm the covenant we made? Of course. And we must continue our commitment to live a life just like him. We don't have a choice. Let's go to Acts 7. Acts 7, we're going to talk about Stephen. You know what I'm doing here. Acts 7, we're going to go to verse 54. After Stephen's address, right? Acts 7 in verse 54. It says here, when they heard these things, Acts 7 verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He's given a vision at this moment, a wonderful gift from God. In verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with, accord, with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is hard to comprehend. Lord, don't charge them with this sin. Why not? Charge away. It's wrong. Don't do that. Receive and to say something like that, 
Why not? They deserve it, don't they? I mean, he speaks the truth and they kill them for it? Convict them. Punish them. Do it. Call fire down from heaven. But that's not what he says. He kneels down. Rocks are hitting his body. And he prays to God to not charge him with this sin. Again, it's tough to consider the expectations. Who are we and what does God expect of us? Are we willing to change our lives, to be different, to push, to go to this level? Are we there? Many of us have talked to this, about this in the past. I know I have. I know I've mentioned this many times ago. I'm not there yet. But to evaluate, to examine, to say, okay, I got to get there. Stop making excuses, Fritz. Get to work. We look at these things and say, okay, I got to do better. I, I have no choice. How much time is going to go by before I begin to make big changes in my life? Every one of us, that's what we're thinking, right? Every one of us right now, again, in preparation for the Passover, not just the Passover. Yes, this is a special occasion. It's a big deal. But we're trying to prepare to meet God. We're going to become God. We're going to have our life changed to be something so incredible. We got to get ready. And things are not going to get easier. It's not all going to go away. We're all just going to go, well, it's fine. Got another 50, 100 years. Who knows? Time will expire. And we need to get ready. And things are going to get more and more difficult. So we must prepare. We must get ready. We have to ask these questions now. We cannot wait until the last second and go, okay, 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 I'll do the right thing now. Now's a good time. I was, it's too hard before. I didn't really want to do that. But now I have no choice because here comes Christ. When I was too late. He's knocking. We didn't answer. We have to open the door today. Let's go to Matthew 18. Matthew chapter 18. We'll go to verse 21. Here Christ is talking. Initially, he's talking about becoming as little children. Again, the humility humbles himself as this little child. is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. And Christ gives us perspective about what he expects out of us, the humility. It's one of the best parts. I've often talked about Mr. Muss in the same way. I just really enjoy it. You work with young people. They don't have all the answers yet. They still go, yeah, you know, i got to fix that. I could change that. I've had uh, uh, different times of... Uh, young people make major changes in their life because they simply want to do the right thing and they're hungry just to get at it. I'm talking about that humility that you know, we keep examining, keep evaluating. And we come down to verse 21 as they've, they've heard all this, talking about personal interactions and relationships, how to govern these things, what God expects out of us. After all of this has been said, we come to verse 21 where Peter asked Christ a question. And he says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. I love it. I love it. That's actually probably more than I would have done. Like seven, that's a lot. But Peter's probably like, that's a number of perfection. This is going to be good. God's going to love it. Christ is going to think this is awesome. I came up with this all on my own. Seven times, that sounds good. It's a good round number. Fantastic. And Jesus says to him, verse 22, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. I can just hear Peter right now, because if I were Peter, I would have been saying this right now. Okay, so 490. Got it. This is, whew. So I've got 428 left. Fantastic. And I'd, and I'm only thinking, I can't wait to meet, to meet Peter. Um, I know myself, I know how I would be thinking that moment, just counting him down, like, I'll give my wife one more get out of jail free card. You're running out, baby, 490. Oh, boy, I tell you what. Oh, man, I've been away from home for too long. I'm like, I get home. She's going to have this long list of things we need to talk about. <laughs> Up to 70 times 7. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, verse 24, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. 
and laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay what you owe. Now, there's a major discrepancy between these amounts of money. Verse 29, So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. It's what he deserved, right? Justice. Verse 31 says, So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. You can see here, this, this is not a game with God. It's not a suggestion. It's not wishful thinking. He's not hoping that maybe we'll take the right steps. He's telling you these are real things we're talking about. Real change matters. We've got to do things differently. We've got to push ourselves beyond our own human nature. We cannot settle for who we are and what we are. As much as it depends on us, we must seek peace with all our brothers and sisters in the begotten family of God. Seek peace with all men, every man, woman, and child on the planet. As much as it depends on us, we want to be at peace with them. To make sure that they know that, that we have that outgoing concern, that love, that care. Not just words we say on a radio program or television or a YouTube video or something like that, but that our actions represent our words. Where they can see a difference between these things. Now these people are not just somebody who talks a good game, but in their actions I see something that's different. That they should look at us and see God. Let's see what time. A few weeks ago, we talked about uh, Esau and Jacob. Actually, it was longer than that. It's one of my favorite stories. We're not going to go through all of it today. I had it in my notes. I figured we'd just go back and check it out again. But honestly, that moment of Esau and Jacob, after everything they had been through, the deception of Jacob, what he had done, stealing from his brother, the lies, the deceit he made with his father. Esau's rightfully going to kill him, or at least in my mind. He's like, he kind of deserves it. But it wasn't the character of God. Nevertheless, the parents find out. They ship him off, ship Jacob off, and there he's gone. Talking over 20 years before the two of them come back together. And so let's go ahead. We'll just read that part of it. As Exodus, or I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 33. Genesis 33. Let's just look at that part. Just at one moment. Genesis 33 and verse 4. This after all that time, they're finally coming back. Here's Jacob. And he sees Esau far off, and then he's trying to figure out all the gifts he can add, and he's trying to put the kids up in different orders, and who's going first, and who's going second. Genesis chapter 33, verse 4, But Esau ran to meet him, and embraced him, and fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. That moment right there, it's one sentence. It's so simple. But to imagine what really is taking place here, if we look at the whole picture, how many years had gone by, how much hurt? I mean, to imagine the nights where Jacob's laying in bed at night thinking about Esau. What are we doing right now? How's his kid? Does he have kids? Did he get married? Where's he at? Will I ever see him again? What happens if I go back and he's there? Will he kill me? I mean, sit there and you, you think about it. At least I do. I, I go back. I can only imagine what was going on in their heads. Do we do the same? There are people that you think about, people you miss, people that you remember, relationships you had. How far would you go? Would you close the door and say, that's it? That's the end? I'll never speak to him again. I'll never see him again. Esau runs to meet him. He embraces him. And like I said, for these guys, it took over 20 years. Over 20 years. And that's the way that it worked out. How far are you willing to go? How far am I willing to go? Can we reflect the nature and character of God himself? God the Father, Jesus Christ, gave everything. Everything. Again, hoping that we would make the right decision. And yes, we do not get there just by their grace. We do have to live a certain kind of life to choose, to obey God's commands, to keep the law, statutes, and judgments, to develop godly character, to grow and increase in that. He expects that. Show me your faith by your works. It's not enough to believe. But the sacrifice, they made that together by themselves. 
before we had ever done a thing. They went all the way so that we could have this door open. Even in times when we disagree within our family, we can all together pray for this moment to come. This moment right here, where they embrace once again. This is our responsibility, every one of us. Do we really need to wait 20 years to reconcile? What's the appropriate amount of time? How long with the people you love the most? As much as it depends on us, we must seek peace with all. All of us have to look inside. I have to look inside myself and ask God mercifully to reveal my sins and my faults so that I can see the error of it and fix it. I don't want to keep doing that. None of us do. But show us, please be gentle, please be merciful, please be patient. But I got to see it so I can make the change. We have to see it so we can make the change. And then we pour ourselves into making those changes, overcoming sin, overcoming Satan, overcoming this world, overcoming ourselves. And there are absolutely no excuses for any one of us to harbor the anger, the bitterness, and contempt for one another. We're trying to get ready for the Passover season to take this Passover in a worthy manner. Yesterday, I went to the headquarters of my former organization. It was short, less than 30 minutes. I wasn't asking for anything in return, not to argue or debate. This was something I had to do, knowing in my heart it was not, I was not in the right frame of mind. I know that about myself. I can look inside myself. Approaching the Passover, I know that something's wrong. I simply wanted to look at my brother together in the eye and tell my brothers in Christ that I love them. Not just words, but to really mean it. That we are family regardless of our disagreements. That's a fact. No, we are not on the same page. We're not. Nevertheless, I very much look forward to a day when God makes all these things clear as he shapes and molds us in his image with mercy and compassion on us all. And in the meantime, every one of us must move forward with humility and love, with outgoing care and concern for our family, that we pray for one another, keep the doors open to reconciliation even when we disagree. Do we disagree? Yes. We're not on the same page, but we'll never talk to each other again. Will that end the relationship forever? What does God expect of every one of us individually, as much as it depends on me, as much as it depends on you? How far are we willing to go? Again, that we would pray for one another and keep the doors open to reconciliation even when we disagree. That we want every one of us in his kingdom together. And that should be said of every organization in the faith. Even while we disagree in certain matters, we are still family. One body, one spirit, one hope, with one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in us all. Either he is or he's not. How can we stand before God and give an account of all that we have done and all we are unless we have done absolutely everything in our power to demonstrate the unconditional love of God? And that's up to every one of us, every, every individual, every one of us differently. I know myself. There are certain things that all of us have to do. If that's an issue we have. This, again, is not a game. And we cannot just go through the motions. Some symbols, some bread, some wine, and just move on. We can't fake it. It has to be real. The one who searches our heart and mind, he knows the difference. We will not fool him. To forgive one another, heartfelt, sincere, it has to be real. Again, that our love be unconditional. No conditions, no excuses. John 13. John chapter 13. Here, Jesus Christ institutes the foot washing service. John chapter 13 and verse 1. 
Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter, of course, says to him, You shall never wash my feet. You don't do that. I'll wash your feet. We don't do that here. You don't got to do that. I love you. You don't have to. My feet, you don't want that. And it's interesting God picks the feet, right? Like, oh, man. It could have been hands. That would have been nice. Feet? Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Because Jesus answered at him and said, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Is it optional? Is it voluntary? We don't take any time off, no years off. This is dedicated. It's imperative that all of us make every effort to make sure we carry out the foot washing service. If you do not, or if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. The world talks about this as voluntary. I remember reading it years ago. You can find it. Most Protestant churches, the voluntary foot washing service, it is not. It's not voluntary. We have to do it. It's a part of the practice and the example set by Jesus Christ himself. And this is done at a very dangerous time, the night before his crucifixion. Right? This night he's taken. And yet here he is at a very difficult time. Jesus Christ makes sure they have this example. One more thing he doesn't want them to forget. One more thing he wants to make sure that we do. Why? Because it has such a big part. Verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you do them. Well, we want to be blessed. We want to do these things. We want to follow the example. He says, do it just like I showed you. The example that I've shown, make sure that we do this thing. Make sure that we have the attitude, this symbolic. That is symbolic of the humility to get on our hands and knees and to wash the feet of our brother and sister in Christ. And there could be no one that we say, well, not that individual. Everybody but him. Everybody but her. That I cannot do, that I will not do. It's difficult. We know, of course, Jesus Christ washed Judas' feet. We know he knew what he was going to do before he did it, and he did it anyways. Christ washed his feet anyways. We've all heard this. We know this. We've heard this for years and years and years. It's one thing to read it, but another thing to embody that character and nature of God, to change who we are, to do it just like this, with no conditions, that we would honor and serve our Father, demonstrating the love that he demands. If we keep going here, go ahead and drop down to verse 31. Verse 31 says, So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going you cannot come. So now I say to you. Verse 34, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, by this right here, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Christ talked about this again back in Matthew 5 where he said, the world loves those who love them. They already do those things. But to love your enemy, to love those who have used you, who have hurt you perhaps. Christ is saying, this is how you even know that you're his. 
Everybody else out, they do those things. But you and I are held to a different level. The measure that is being used against us is God the Father and Jesus Christ. That's the bar. Love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, they'll know we're different. The world will see us and see him. Christ continues talking about that right here in John chapter 14. If you look at verse 7, it's the same context. Remember, we're not seeing a big break here. It's not like this is uh, six months later, of course. The same night. It's a few moments later. John 14, verse 7. If you had known me, if you had known me, you would have known my father. Uh, and from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Again, just, wait, wait, I didn't see him. Did anybody else see him? Did we miss it? What happened? Where did he go? Was he here? I didn't see it. I, I, I stepped out of the room for five seconds. I come back. Philip says, Lord, uh, would you show us the Father? It's sufficient. Then we're, we're with you. We're on the same page then. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you have not known me, Philip? I mean, how, long, how much time do I have to spend with you? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? You and I, every one of us individually, do we have that measure of God the Father dwelling in us? When they see us, have they seen him? It's a yes or no question. Either it's true or it's not. If it's not, examine, evaluate, fix it. Make sure every one of us, we're going to every last effort. Do you not believe, again, verse 10, that I am in the Father, the Father in me, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. For them to be able to see God the Father, for them to be able to see, and I'm saying the world, our family, not in the church, our children, they, they see us and see a glimpse of the coming kingdom. That is the expectation that we have to be something so special, to be a representative of God on earth. And again, we know how hard this is. Uh, this is a whole difficult subject to look at, especially when we're going back to seeing the character and nature of God, and then you go, that's too much. I don't know if I could do that. I mean, how will I ever have that kind of strength and power? How, how could I do that? It's already dwelling in us. We have to stir it up. We have to use it. God says, try me these things. In that moment of Malachi, he's talking about tithe, but tithe is just an example. If we obey God, try him out. Watch how it works. It works. You cannot deny it. The promise has been made by the Father. If we obey, if follow his instruction, we do what he says, we will be blessed. God's way works. But we have to do it, even when it's very difficult. Just a couple more. We'll wrap up Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 11. Hebrews 9, verse 11. But Christ... Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. And Jesus Christ entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. How much more, read it again, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, how much more shall that cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We hope it does. When we read these things and consider that shed blood is there to give us an opportunity to receive a measure of God, that our conscience would be cleansed, that we could change from this life of dead works, of walking as a man, of walking according to the flesh, 
to put away those things and put on Christ, to put on God, the character, the nature of Him. And again, we see the expectations to serve the living God. Verse 14, I'm sorry, Verse. Uh, continuing here, verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. He always points us back to that. To be cleansed from dead works, to change who we are, that we're pushing towards this eternal inheritance. That it's not for nothing. Even though it's difficult, it'll be the most difficult things we've ever done in our lives. Again, to reject human nature over and over again, daily and weekly and monthly and yearly, every step of the way, preparing. But that we may take hold, grab a hold, through God's mercy, the promise of eternal inheritance. Finally, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Colossians 1 and verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will. What does God want for us? We want to be just like Him. Filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord. It matters how we walk. When they see us, do they see Him? Do our actions represent Him? Does our love look like His love? That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. This, real this reality cannot be changed. God the Father, Jesus Christ, they did what they set out to do. Christ would empty Himself, would crucify would be crucified, would be scourged, and God the Father would allow all of it to happen, that we could have this wonderful gift, redemption through His blood. It then goes on in verse 15, again we see the promise, God always pointing us back to the encouragement, to be encouraged through all of this, to be encouraged, to keep forcing ourselves through these changes. When He says in verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, not the last. It's not going to stop because we are going to succeed. We're going to conquer our human nature. And we won't stop until we're done. All of us, we're not going to give up now. This is going to be the greatest Passover we have ever had. We're going to push ourselves beyond everything from where we've been to do more. To reflect this character and nature of God. Verse 16 for by him are all things, or all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Christ, God the Father, together they are the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. He became flesh, and the door was opened. The family of God is going to continue. You and I are going to fight the good fight and finish the race. God will continue to shape and mold us according to His perfection and His will. This Passover, we must endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, preparing to reaffirm this commitment to the covenant we made where we signed on the dotted line, we remember that we have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer we who live, but that Christ is living in us. In the life that we now live, we do not live for ourselves as to be representatives of God. Ask yourselves the tough questions. Am I really ready for the Passover? Have I changed from what I was 
from who I used to be, am I ready to inherit all things? For God so loved the world that he gave everything for this opportunity. Grab a hold of our opportunity. Don't let the moment pass by. This year pass by with so much bitterness, anger, and contempt in the world and potentially in the body of Christ. Let love be without hypocrisy and our actions reflective of the character and nature of God himself. For more information, go to our website at cogassembly.org. Copyright 2021, Church of God Assembly, all rights reserved.